first, I want to thank uh, Matt for inviting me. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, my focus is not so much, is not on autonomous weaponry per se. I've written primarily on drones. I'm going to be talking about the law governing in this area, which is somewhat complex. It's a very sophisticated audience. I know many of you know this area as well, so I'm not going to try to dwell on it. I'm also going to talk about one of the very problematic areas of the law dealing with so called failed states, and likewise, whether the use of drones for killing suspected terrorists is, even if legal, is wise. Does it advance world public order? Let's see. I'd like you to take a look at this one. This is Orlando Letelier. As you may know, he was uh, killed by a Chilean agent in Washington, D.C., along with one of the with him. And they were, they were killed, okay, uh, because the, he was a foreign minister, as you may know, the Allende regime, okay, and Pinochet came to power again, and killed in Washington, D.C. And the question we have to ask ourselves, was this a violation of international law? And the answer is pretty simple. Yes, absolutely, it was a violation of international law. It was a violation of international law from many different perspectives. Let's take a look at the first one. It's a violation, it was a violation of the state sovereignty of the United States. Because even if it wasn't an attack on U.S. soil in the sense of an armed attack by legions of troops, nonetheless, on international law, it is considered a violation to uh, send an agent, an assassination team, okay, on your turf. And this is a violation really more uh, fully codified under Article 2 of the United Nations. Now, aside from that, it was a violation of human rights law. This is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the most important international human rights treaty. And it says, as you can see there, that every human being has inherent rights of life. Okay? The rights shall be protected by the Lord. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of life. So in this situation, uh, they were. Uh, we can talk about it. There's some little exceptions here and there. We'll talk about that later. Lastly, this is the restatement of foreign relations of the United States, okay, which is considered quite authoritative in the area of international law, and points out that as a matter of customary international ties, but aside from treaty law, that murder, okay, or causing disappearance, is a clear violation. So here we have unquestionably a violation of international law. Now, what if okay, it were not Orlando Latoya? What if it was John Gotti, okay, who was killed okay, by, let's say, a U.S. Okay, uh, FBI agent. Would that violate international law? Would that violate domestic law? Okay. And the answer is yes. Even though the person is not a nice guy, okay? even, even, if he's, even if he is a murderer, okay? we cannot, you know, under, under international law, okay, both domestic and human rights law, we cannot kill. So that's our baseline position. However, there is an exception. Okay? This is the general. But as you know, there's an exception. So let's, let's take a look at something. Let's take a look at Asoboko Yamamoto. Okay? Asoboko Yamamoto, as you may know, was, the, he was an admiral in the Japanese uh, Navy. Okay? He was the commander in chief of the combined fleets. He also was the architect behind the attack on, on Pearl Harbor. Okay? As you also may know, uh, we had cracked the Japanese codes. And we knew that he was going to be uh, visiting troops and during, at a certain time, flying from island to island. Okay? So we sent out uh, 16 lightnings to kill him. Okay? And in fact, we did kill him. Right? So the question now is, was that a violation of international law? Okay? And the answer, as you may know, generally, we would say, no, why not? Okay? Let's go through. Law of war regime actually okay, is complex. We have something that's called just and bell, one just and bell, and just and bell. This is the first question. Okay? Like we can use, I'm not kind of go back, this is the UN Charter, which as you know, was actually uh, formulated in 1945. He was killed in 1943. But let's just assume for argument's sake, just for simplicity, that we have this. No, this is Article 21 Charter, which sets out the self-defense provision. It basically says, you can see for yourself, nothing in the present charter shall appear that hurt right individual or collective self-defense, quote unquote, if an armed attack occurs. Well, guess what? Okay. 
on December 7, 1941, and in fact, Pearl Harbor was attacked. So we have a clear case of an attack. We have the right, assuming that I'm going to be a little uh, technical the dates, to then attack, use force, and self defense. But nonetheless, it has to be proportionate force. Okay? It can't be force that, that's really over the top, it's excessive. But nonetheless, we have that right. I want to take a look. Picture here. And, uh, but okay, now, this is the interesting thing about it. Okay? This is the right to use force. We discussed about it. Now, the question as to whether he was legal to kill Kamamoto has nothing to do with whether or not we have the right to use force as a nation in self defense. We are now dealing with a completely separate legal regime called Joss and Bell, often called humanitarian law, often called by the, by the U.S. Uh, what is law of conflict, okay? uh, law of war. But this is the regime we're discussing. And under humanitarian law, we are completely indifferent as to whether the party had the right to use force. They might ask yourself, why? Because every country that goes to war claims it has the right to use force. When Hitler, in September 1st, 1939, invaded Poland, starting World War I, he claimed that he did so to protect German citizens who were being abused by the Polish. It was complete, you know, it was a complete phony rationale. But what essentially, okay, since the Renaissance, when these rules began to come in place, recognized that we can't base our rules on whether a country has the right or doesn't have the right to use force. So that's completely off the table. Now, so, okay, this generally requires, by the way, that a state of armed conflict exists, okay, which we'll hopefully get back to in a minute, and a state of armed conflict, in fact, uh, unquestionably, World War II did exist. Okay? Now, once that is established, our next step is, I'll, I'll, flip, I'll flip back to the next one. This is, uh, Yeshua Poker 1, 1977, which uh, Peter mentioned in his talk. Okay. This is one of the foundational, for those of you who don't know international humanitarian law, it is the foundational uh, humanitarian law a treaty in the United States. It's not a party to it, although nonetheless we recognize almost all of its provisions, with the exception of one or two, as being customary international law. So this is essentially the law. And our first step is really is, was Yamamoto a combatant? And you'll see this, and there's one force of the party to the conflict of the law are combatants. He was a member of the army. He was the head person. Unquestionably, he was a combatant under this particular um, definition. Now, our next step uh, on the foot back is okay, protection of such. The population of such as well as individuals shall not be subject to attack. He's not a civilian. Okay. So therefore, okay, under the law of war, he can be, he can be attacked. Okay. Now, so we would say, we would, we would all agree, I think most of us would agree, that it was legal to, in fact, bring his plane down. I want to think of a couple of things, though. We'll get to prior damages. And I want to talk about chivalry. So you may think chivalry is dead. And perhaps it is, okay, on my support. But the thing to recognize is that is that even cold, this is during the desert storm, as you may not know, I don't know how many follow this, but when the Iraqi troops were retreating in desert storm, okay, the first Iraq war, we were really wiping them, literally wiping them off the map, literally, okay? And Powell thought it was excessive. And he persuaded uh, President George H. Warren Bush to stop. And Powell's term was that it was unchivalrous to completely slaughter these troops probably legal. They were combatants, okay? Probably legal, okay? They, they were still technically fighting, but it was on chivalrous, okay? And that leads us to the next point about that motive. As you may or may not know, uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, who just retired from the Supreme Court, was actually, he was back by the last justice to have served in uh, World War II, okay? Well, he served in military intelligence, and he helped crack the code that brought down Yamamoto. Interesting. Anyhow, okay, the thing about it is he was really upset that the code was used in this fashion. Okay? 
that to, to target a particular individual, and to his words were, target a particular individual with intent to kill him is a lot different than killing a soldier in battle. So what we have here is probably a legal attack. I think it's hard to claim it was illegal. But I think we can also argue that it was on chivalrous. On the other hand, okay, one of our pilots, okay, Ray Hine, did not come back from that mission. Okay, so we sent a fleet of, a fleet of those lightning, as I said, to get him, but we lost one pilot. Let's, yeah, okay, we can move to, move to drones here for a second, okay? Let's, let's just move to that and I'll come back to uh, collateral damage in a second. Well, this is, this is the Predator, this is the Predator drone. Those are two Hellfire missiles that it carries that have been fired there. Hellfire missile is designed to be able to take out a tank, okay? And it can certainly take out and destroy a house, okay? So, let's go back to collateral damage for a second. And then it, uh, This was the same site, the same provision, actually not the same. The Article 157 very closely related. In AP1, is again mission protocol one. And it's an attack which may be expected to cause incident loss of life, injury to civilians, being damaged, or combination thereof, which would be excessive in relation to concrete and direct military damage. So we have incident loss of civilian life is on one side of the scale. And okay, uh, we have concrete and direct military advantage anticipated on the other side of the scale. This is a very sophisticated audience, but the one thing one should recognize is that how do you balance these two? I mean, it's apples and bananas, okay? Seriously. I mean, how do you determine what is a concrete and direct military advantage anticipated, okay? And how do you determine, well, how, how do you really out, how does this outweigh? It's, it's a, again, we had this discussion a lot at, at, at the breaks. It's a very vague standard and very difficult to demonstrate a violation as a result. It's very difficult. Now, as you know, under international law, the law of war, there are some limits. Okay? We have to distinguish between combatants and non combatants, military objects okay? and uh, civilian objects like churches, you know, hospitals. That's rule number one. Rule number two, however, is that we have this collateral damage rule, which essentially permits us to kill a lot of civilians. As I mentioned over lunch, I'm sure it occurred me, is that the, the uh, ICRC commentary says that it would be unlawful to kill, to wipe out a village, to kill a single off-duty soldier. But, you know, if there were two off-duty soldiers, if they were both on duty, okay, you know, one could make an argument that you could. So this is an expansive rule. Now, I'd like to go back to, uh, to the beginning here, actually. Go back to the I'm not, I'm not a big user of Jimmy Lee Dykes, as you may have read, a couple of months ago, kidnapped a five-year-old kid in Alabama. The police came in, I found him, and the kid, he still had the kid, and they killed Jimmy Lee Dykes. Probably a permissible use of force in peacetime. Because there was a, a life imminently in danger. So we can kill under those circumstances. So don't want that. What if Billy Lee Dyke's spouse was there? Could the police have killed her too? I think the answer is unquestionably no. If, if the police saw her right there, they would have to stand down. They could not do it. So in peacetime, this notion of collateral damage is completely off the table. There's no way that that is permissible. Okay? Even if you have this, this kid, this five-year-old kid who, whose life arguably is really in danger, Nonetheless, collateral damage is completely impermissible okay, when you're dealing outside of, outside of the framework. So that kind of brings us to, let me, let me now go back to our uh, predator drawing here for a second. Okay. Yeah, here's the thing about predator, this is uh, a house in Yemen was destroyed by a predator drawing. 
As I mentioned before, you know, one Hellfire missile can knock out a tank or bring it bring down a house. I don't know how many Hellfire missiles we I presume these were Hellfire missiles, there may have been Reaper drones, as you may know, also carry two 500 pound laser guided bombs. But nonetheless, okay, uh, yeah, this type of action could not have been carried out okay, in Alabama, to say the very least. Obviously, the kidney bombs you would not do it anyway, but even assuming they were, again, it really could not do it. This is the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, President Obama. President Obama gave a good speech, okay, saying that now he's sorry that, about using drones so much. Okay, we'll talk about that later if you'd like. But if, if we're going to still authorize the use of drones, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to comply with his statement that no civilian casualties are going to result. It's very, I mean, if he's going to use this weapon, now it's true that apparently they have some ordinance that might be a little smaller, but nonetheless, it's extraordinarily difficult to make that, to make that fight. Now, Now, I want to move a little bit to this question of failed states. Bush Cheney administration, I say it's a global war against terrorism. Really problematic. And by the way, as you know, those of you who that every member of the Bush Cheney administration at the right of 9 11 was spouting this out and left and right global war on terrorism. This was this every they had talking points to war about this. So this was kind of drummed into the American public. It became a catchphrase. The difficulty with this, with this terminology is that it's extraordinarily vague and extraordinarily broad. What is terrorism anyway? Okay. Terrorism occurs okay, all the time. It occurs and it's never ending. And also global war. I mean, what, what does all this mean? One of the things that I just want to mention very quickly <coughs> is that getting into the war of Iraq was supported by this terminology. You, you know, you were mentioning, Elash, you were mentioning about rhetoric. Rhetoric has really been something we've got to really start fighting against. Because this terminology helped them sell the Iraq war. Did Saddam Hussein support terrorism? Yes. Okay. He was sending money to suicide bombers, you know, in, uh, uh, in Palestine. Right? He was. Okay. There was very, there was no evidence that he was behind that. Even though more than 50% of the American people believed he was, okay, because of the, the way they talked about uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction and Al Qaeda in the same breath. Okay? And this vague term really permitted an expansion of the conflict. Now, the Obama administration, you might think, was progressive. I thought they were progressive. Okay? They came up with a slightly different terminology. And they came up with this. That the administration, no, we're not in a global war in terms of, we're in armed conflict with Al Qaeda, the Taliban, and quote unquote associated forces, and can attack them in any country in the world that is unwilling or unable to arrest or capture. The OLC, Office of Legal Counsel, recent memo actually uses the term uh, unable or unwilling to repress them, so I assume that could kill them. But the point is, okay, this terminology accomplished the same result that the global war terrorism term. The difficulty is that if the Obama administration, according to the OLC memo, if one senior official in the administration, presumably including a member of the senior official of the CIA, concludes that a given country is not okay, able to, uh, is unwilling or able to arrest or capture, then the United States can, we can drop a drone on that individual. Okay? So they're really, this is a, this is a really major issue. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, sure. But, but this is limiting in some way just to Al Qaeda and Taliban. And, and, and it's, it's more, you're right, it's more definite than saying global war and terrorism. But it used the term associated forces. Okay. Now, yeah, what does associated forces really mean? Now that, now that the OLC memo, which is, which is available, I can show it, I have it actually with me, I can show it to you, it talks about co belligerence, but you know, as you may or may not know, the, the Islamic world, you know, any two-bit organization that wants to get a little fame for themselves, kind of rename themselves and call them, you know, you know, Al-Qaeda and wherever, okay? So it, it's really, a, it's a, there's really a, a, an issue with this. 
other issue, and those of you who are really interested in the area, you should really take a look at Philip Alston's uh, 2010 uh, report. He has you know, had been the rapporteur for the, uh, for, for the uh, UN Human Rights Council. He wrote an excellent report on this, and I think he explains it very well. But I want to come back to something here on this. Because if you remember, armed conflict, okay? Oh. Oh, just go back a little. Yeah, just five minutes. Oh, okay. Right. 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 Remember I said that the law of war regime is exceptional. Okay. The general rule is human rights law, but it's plenary. Human rights law also applies to every time of war, but it's plenary. So it's in complete power in peacetime. But our conflict is the condition by which law of war can actually occur. So in other words, law of war controls if there is an armed conflict. But armed conflict requires protracted armed violence between government authority, and I'm going to talk about terrorist organizations, and organized groups. It can't just be sporadic. It's got to be protracted. You're talking about really, really, a, a, like, an, a, like what's happening in Afghanistan is an armed conflict. No one would disagree. Okay? That's an armed conflict. But in other areas of the world, there's some real questions. To weather There's ICT-1 and also the Rome Statute of the ICC, which is becoming a predominant uh, uh, foundation of much of, of humanitarian law. Okay, basically borrows the same definition. So what, what's happening with uh, the administration, and Ken Anderson, by the way, okay, you know that piece that he writes, big defending this, he's one of the primary uh, exponents of the idea of his own evil and willing rationale as a way just to go into a country. Again, very similar. It's interesting seeing him there. Okay? And it long story short about this is that this is really a narrow exception that can be used, for example, I'll use the example of Pakistan. The tribal areas of Pakistan are used as a launching ground for attacks into Afghanistan. There's been a long history of countries saying that, yes, if, if, if state a is permitting part of its territory to be used as a haven, and there's an adjoining armed conflict, okay, and that state is really kind of contributing to that armed conflict, well then, we can consider that area part of the armed conflict. Now, uh, uh, my good friend Emory kind of disagrees with me on this, but, but I, I, think, I think that's the better view. So in that narrow context, okay, okay, if they really is using the launching ground, and they're not doing anything, and really Pakistan is not doing that much in, in this area, that's all right. But you can't just say, based on that kind of narrow exception, hey, you can, we can go any place in the world okay, where a state, in our view, okay, okay, is not, kind of, not coming up to stuff. Now, I want to have three notes. Right, now, here's the McDonald's solution to this. Because this is a hard problem. It's a hard problem. I mean, the, the problem of, the, of particularly a failed haven state. I mean, what do you do with a failed haven state? I mean, these, these organizations we know, basically, the mega terrorist event of, of 2001 occurred on September 11th. We know that that can happen. So what is the solution? I actually uh, take a page out of R2P. I think, in other words, humanitarian intervention, the idea that we can't just have one country Deciding that basically, according to the OLC memo, one senior official can say, "Yeah, go into Somalia, go into wherever, and just take these people out." Okay, it's got to be a broad coalition of states in that very narrow area. The reason we don't have time for this, but, but the, the problem is that the Security Council okay, can issue binding orders to use force, but because of the P5, the permanent member. The council is kind of broken. Yet one country can stop any rescue attempt for another Holocaust. One P5 member. So, so I think you know R2P, which essentially, well, it, I'm not going to belabor it. But the idea behind it is that you want a broad coalition of states who are going in for the sole purpose of of protection. There has to be a very high threshold of threat. Okay? And one might be able to, to kind of push the boundary just a little bit. Uh, if I may be put it just one. Okay, I just got a couple. Okay. 
one other thing, if you just take a look at the, at the, from a policy viewpoint, the use of these drones from a high-tech society against a country using low-tech that has experienced colonization at the hands of the, of the West okay, is really in, in, in making people to hate us more. It is strengthening the forces that we're trying to oppose. There's some, I can go into this a little later depth, but I mean, time is up. But the, the point is, one has to, we have to kind of rethink. We have to come up with a much more nuanced, nuanced policy that recognizes that killing people, killing them on this one-on-one -on -one fashion, is likely not only to be counterproductive, but also to undermine our moral authority.